What's up? It's Dr. Taylor, Washington Wellness Center, and today's video uh, should be a short one, but it's a, it's a heavy one. But Lyme disease and Epstein-Barr virus cross-reactivity with foods. Crazy stuff once you get into this cross-reactivity. So I'm going to explain that. It's going to be quick. But Lyme disease, Epstein-Barr, you know, such common things that you hear out there, um, and especially Epstein-Barr, but like just really, really common stuff. So let's get into it. Uh, this is based on a study. So uh, are we going? There we go. Um, so here's the study. It's from uh, Clinical and Cellular Immunology, 2015. It's written by Dr. Vijadani, one of my mentors. Uh, you've, if you've watched a lot of our videos, you know, Dr. Vijadani is the director of Cyrex Labs, so we use Cyrex Labs for a lot of our lab testing. He is the godfather of, of kind of IgG food sensitivity testing and um, autoimmune testing. Cyrex is, is, is well known as the world leader in autoimmune testing. And that's what antibody testing is. So that's what we're looking at here. So we're looking at what we're looking at, what we're talking about is cross reactivity. And what that means, before I go into a picture here, what that means is basically a case of mistaken identity. And so the metaphor that I use with my patients is like, okay, what if there is a, a warrant out for somebody with a silver Jeep Grand Cherokee, and it's not me, but they're looking for somebody and he's a bad guy. And so everyone's out looking for him and they see me driving around town. And, you know, obviously I have a silver piece of crap Jeep Grand Cherokee, that's what I usually tell my patients, is like, what if the cops are looking for a piece of crap Jeep Grand Cherokee, they, they might accidentally pull me over in a case of mistaken identity. And maybe in the worst case scenario, you know, maybe they cart me off to jail or something, but that's basically what cross reactivity is, is a case of mistaken identity. So this picture really sums it up. So the pink part in here is a gluten antibody, meaning uh, an antibody means that your immune system has flagged gluten as an enemy, enemy, a known enemy of the body, and it's begun to make antibodies against it, meaning the adaptive immune system has recognized it, and you now have antibodies, which is, you know, really famous in the COVID world of, you know, antibodies and things. So that means that your immune system has, it knows that gluten is an enemy, knows that it's, uh, not good, it's, it remembers it, and so anytime that it sees gluten, it's going to release these antibodies or start producing these antibodies. These things called B cells turn to plasma cells, plasma cells make antibodies, and you know, bada bing, bada boom, part of the Th2 immune system. So anyway, this pink thing is a gluten antibody. So as you can see here, the gluten antibody matches up perfectly with the gluten protein molecule, the gliadin molecule. So there's complete binding. So it matches up perfect. This is like a, a uh, key fitting into a lock. It matches up perfectly. But the next one is maybe you got a key that's like really, 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 really close. And it's not the exact key. It wasn't made for that lock. But maybe the key's a little worn down. Maybe the lock's a little worn down. And if you wiggle it just right, it actually fits. So a known cross-reactor with gluten antibodies is dairy. And there are other known cross-reactors with gluten antibodies. And, you know, we do the testing for that. Um, gosh, I can't think of them off the top of my head. I'm surprised. Uh, but there are several other known cross-reactors. But you can see here, the, the, they don't match up perfectly, but they match up well enough that there's a binding. And once there's a binding then that's going to go uh, to parts of the immune system and say, hey, look what we found. Let's raise havoc. Let's raise inflammation. Let's kill this thing. So there's an incomplete binding, but it's a complete enough that, that it works. So it's like the lock actually fits into the key. It's not perfect, but it actually works. Then the last one is the gluten antibody runs into something like rice, and it doesn't match up. It's like you're not a fit. You're, you don't match. This key does not fit into this lock. You, maybe you're driving a black, you know, nice SUV, and, and you know the cops don't don't mistake you for 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 me. So that's cross reactivity in a nutshell. So here's this paper. Now I'm going to read it just really quickly. But during the past ten years, we have observed 
that some patients with high titers of antibodies, meaning that you got a lot of these antibodies floating around for high titers of antibodies against the herpes family of viruses. So herpes, uh, herpes one, herpes two, those are, those are traditionally called herpes, you know, cold sores, one's oral, one's uh, more genital, um, herpes three, herpes four is, is Epstein-Barr, um, there's HHV6, there's HHV7, there's, you know, m lots of members of the, the herpes family, herpetic viruses. So we have observed that in some patients with high levels of antibodies against the herpes family, they also exhibit high antibodies against Borrelia burgdorferi, which is Lyme disease. And it's well known that the Epstein-Barr antibodies can cross-react with Lyme, or maybe it's the vice versa that Lyme antibodies can cross-react with Epstein-Barr. That's more like it. That is, that is exactly what it is, is that Lyme antibodies can cross-react with Epstein-Barr. It might go both ways, but anyway, that's well known. Um, but yeah, so what they did is they, they, checked, um, they checked these antibodies. So what they did, they applied monoclonal and affinity-purified polyclonal antibodies. So they took these antibodies against Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, measles, rubella, herpes simplex type 1, varicella zoster, uh, chickenpox, chlamydia pneumonia, streptokinase, yersinia, borrelia, to 180 different food antigens. So basically, they took these pink antibodies made for things like Epstein-Barr, made for things like Lyme disease, and they just exposed them to 180 different foods to see which one's bound, just like this picture. Just imagine that this said EBV, and maybe it binds with this, it binds with this, it doesn't bind with this. So the results were the Lyme disease antibodies reacted with 39 different foods, the Epstein-Barr viral capsid antigen antibodies with 20 different foods, Epstein-Barr uh, nuclear antigen with 10 different foods, and Epstein-Barr early antigen with 20 different foods, and then rotavirus uh, uh, cross-reacted with 11 and measles with, measles with 4. So it can result in false positivity on your food sensitivity test. But also, we're going to get to this, but th th these foods can trigger your immune system to think that they've got the bad guy. It's like if my Jeep drove into town and somebody's like, oh, this, you know, Taylor Crick is here. Let's create all this inflammation. We've got to go get him. And it's not even... And it's not even me, um, or maybe they're thinking, you know, this bad guy's in town, but it actually is me or something. You get the point, I hope, that it's cross-reactivity. It's mistaken identity. So what are those foods? In Borrelia, so in Lyme disease, the highest reactivity was observed with chicken, lamb, almond, mustard, shrimp, and parvalbumin, okay? So this is the reaction. So this is... Borrelia and 100 different foods, there's almond, there's shrimp, there's mustard, where's chicken? It might be on a different picture. Um, but yeah, so those are the highest cross-reacting foods. So I had a patient recently get a food sensitivity test, and I was like, hmm, this is weird. Why do you react to chicken, almond, Maybe not lamb, but like, you know, a few of these foods. Um, mustard, that's what it was. It was chicken, lamb, or chicken, chicken, almond, mustard. I was like, those are weird. Those aren't common food sensitivities. She has Lyme. She has Lyme antibodies, and the Lyme antibodies bound to those food proteins, and they, and they showed up positive on a food sensitivity test. That's kind of how we figured it out, thank goodness. But it was, it was an interesting one. Now, EBV. The EBV uh, antibodies reacted with 18 different plants and two seafoods. And these are different EBV antibodies. So there's, there's viral capsid antigen, there's, uh, there's early antigen, and there's uh, nuclear antigen. So the greatest reaction against egg white and then moderate reaction against eight different plants in imitation crab. So here's uh, nuclear antigen. Um, egg white was really, really high. Moderate reaction against eight different foods. 170 of the other foods, there was no reaction. And you saw in the, the methods, 
they looked at cytomegalovirus and measles and all these other things. They must not have, have had any cross-reactivity, but especially, especially Lyme and Epstein-Barr did have cross-reactivity. So this is just crazy. So what does this mean? Well, first off, do you have Lyme antibodies? Because if you have Lyme antibodies, they could cross-react. And so maybe you have Lyme, ha had Lyme disease, Maybe Lyme has been eradicated from your body and the antibodies still exist, but the bacteria, the Borrelia burgdorferi, no longer is in your body uh, because of certain things that you've done or because of immune reactivity. But maybe chicken, uh, chicken, lamb, almond are, are maybe tricking your body into thinking, hey, Lyme's still here, Lyme's still here, Lyme's still here. And do you have, and that's rare, you know, Lyme antibodies aren't, aren't nearly as common. Epstein-Barr virus, 90% of the world carries Epstein-Barr virus, and we, a lot of us have these antibodies. And, you know, I've measured two people this week with EBV antibodies over 600, and, and just to give you an idea, 600 is where the lab cuts off at. So, and it's like above 20 is positive, and, and two different people this week above 600. It's really, really common. So, that's really common, uh, and the Lyme is more cross-reactive, but the Epstein-Barr virus, too, your body could be constantly tricked by different foods, thinking, hey, we've got this virus, we need to attack it. Hey, we've got this virus, we need to attack it. Hey, we've got this virus, we need to attack it. And maybe you don't, and, and you know, like I said, everybody has it, but maybe it's uh, dormant, maybe it's latent, maybe it's lying in a cell and it's not really active right now, it's not really causing any problems but your body thinks that it is, so your immune system keeps reacting, and you're caught in this vicious cycle of inflammation. So these foods could be telling your body that Lyme is still present or that EBV is still present, and the immune system continues to mount an attack against them. If you've had food testing and you had things show up like chicken, lamb, or almond, maybe you have Lyme disease like my patient that I mentioned. We, we subsequently measured her her Lyme antibodies, and sure enough, she, she does. Um, so yeah, that's what it means. So this is crazy, and I'm trying to keep this short, uh, but a really, really interesting video. When you understand the concept of cross-reactivity, there's all kinds of cross-reactions out there. Like different foods uh, and thyroid antibodies can cross-react with a lot of different foods, like gluten. Or uh, Yersinia is an infection that can cause like Graves disease. There's all kinds of cross reactivities. I just had an autoimmune flare, had autoimmune uveitis. I had really, really red eyes and, and nothing could help it and it sucked. Um, you know, no, eye drops didn't touch it, nothing helped it. They're, they're just, they're starting to recover. But I luckily through the research, through a lot, a lot, a lot of research, you know, I probably read 50 papers on it. Um, I found that the cross reactions for autoimmune uveitis are rotavirus and casein. And sure enough, I had not been as strict on my dairy. And in fact, I had purposely allowed some dairy back into my life thinking, ah, oh, you know, I, I don't think that I have a dairy reactivity. I don't have any problem. I don't have any GI symptoms. or I don't have any uh, autoimmune symptoms when I eat dairy. So I started eating more dairy. My eyes got red and now I don't touch dairy anymore. So I had to learn the hard way. But luckily, I was able to do the research and figure that out. So cross-reactivity is crazy. It's very, very possible. You could be triggering an autoimmune condition. You could be triggering an infection. You could be triggering an immune response without even having the actual infection, the actual virus, the actual pathogen in there, the actual antigen in there. But at the same time, your body, because of a mistaken identity, thinks that it's there. So it's going haywire and it's mounting an attack Crazy stuff, cross-reactivity.